appreciate um, all of you making the trek, whether from off campus or from locations on. My name is Megan Shepard. I work with the vision program here in the Stupid Church Life, and also will be helping to develop a new initiative for spiritual development and formation opportunities for faculty and staff here at Notre Dame. Um, so this is a kind of an exciting partnership with St. Joe Parish, and we're very grateful to have Gary Anderson here to guide us in our Lenten Bible study. So thank you very much, and welcome. Yes. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate it. So this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I think it's a favorite story of many people. Uh, it's so attractive. First of all, uh, within the Bible and also within the book of Genesis, it's, um, if it's not the longest continuous narrative, it's certainly close to it. Those of you who are familiar with the book of Genesis know that uh, when we encounter the stories, for example, about Abraham or uh, Jacob or Isaac, uh, the three great patriarchs that are going to precede Joseph. Uh, the story kind of proceeds by stops and starts, uh, generally because biblical scholars believe those stories were assembled from uh, independent units. And though they can be read as a continuous whole, uh, they also can be read as uh, independent units. Uh, and that's not the case uh, with the Joseph story. It really, in some senses, is unique in the book of uh, Genesis and uh, for much of the uh, Old Testament and providing us um, a continuous narrative that has uh, lots of uh, highs and lows all building on one another. Uh, it probably is completely unrelated, but um, it is a kind of accident of, of uh, providence or simply historical contingency uh, that it happens to be the longest continuous narrative uh, in the Quran as well, Surat Yusuf, uh, whole uh, surah of the Quran is devoted uh, to the Joseph story, of course, uh, as is the case with almost every biblical story you're going to find in the Quran, it's not uh, like the biblical story because it's been filtered through uh, the lens of subsequent um, Jewish uh, and Christian interpretive history. So uh, the story Muhammad tells in the Quran is actually uh, very interesting for someone who knows the history of uh, Christian and Jewish interpretation uh, of the Bible. That's not something we're going to spend any time on though over the next three weeks. We're going to just try to look at the um, the narrative highlights uh, of this story. How many people are familiar with the Joseph story? Maybe I should ask before I begin, basically have a good sense of what the plot line is. All right, uh, that's good. That's, uh, if not from the story itself, maybe from the, uh, the musical too. <laughs> Technicolor green coat, right? Um, actually, we have no idea uh, how to translate the Hebrew word for that special piece of apparel that Joseph wears. It's uh, what biblical scholars will refer to as a hapex legomena. It's a word that occurs once, and if it only occurs once, then uh, the only meaning you can give it is surely by dint of context, which is uh, just a guess. Um, but really, being clear about its meaning isn't important. Uh, the function of the tunic, which we'll attend to today, uh, is clear uh, as clear can be, and uh, that is to set Joseph uh, over against um, the rest of his uh, brothers. So what I want to focus on today uh, is an element of the story that's very important, which is uh, the element of dreams and dream interpretation. Um, my, just from those of you who are familiar with the story, uh, how many dreams can you think of that take place in this story uh, that are then subsequently interpreted? Pharaoh's dreams. Pharaoh's dreams, right. Good that you put that in the plural. How many are there? <laughs> Three. Three, not I quite. Think. Two. 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 <laughs> Two dreams, right. Joseph's uh, dreams. Joseph's dreams at the very beginning. How many of them are there? Two, 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 two. <laughs> right? And then we're just missing two. Two others. The line, the, the line maker and the breaker. Uh, yeah, the cupbearer is the term, uh, and the baker, right? They each have a dream. So uh, there's two there, though, that is different than the twos of the Pharaoh and Joseph, because in those instances, we have one individual having two separate dreams. There, the, uh, the last set of two, we have three sets of two, are uh, uh, parceled out uh, to uh, two, two discrete individuals, uh, the um, cupbearer 
uh, and the baker, that's, a, that's not a bad place to begin. That's very important. Now, this question is a little bit more detailed, and you might not be able to get it, but, or maybe, I don't know, do we have any Protestants in this room? Oh, good. So we'll have someone who will have claim to biblical knowledge. Uh, <laughs> that's usually my experience when I teach foundations here, is that, um, uh, or any of the biblical studies classes, is that the Catholics are usually at sea. Uh, and my Protestant students, uh, you know, kind of anticipate what my next sentence will be. Uh, with that in mind, no, I'm, not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but uh, uh, just it's, it's great to have Protestants in the room who know the Bible. So the next question here, which I said is a little bit harder, it's actually a lot harder, um, uh, though the Bible is quite clear on the matter. What is the significance of the fact that Pharaoh has two dreams? Uh, as we'll see in a moment, they're, they're really, in some, some senses, redundant. The meaning is the same. Uh, but do you remember, does anyone remember why it's significant that Pharaoh has two rather than one? Well, uh, I didn't expect that people would be able to get that. That would have been a sign of uh, uh, intense Bible reading. Uh, <laughs> but it is, it is an important of some a point of some significance in the story. Uh, Joseph says the fact that you've dreamed this dream twice means that the uh, consequences of that dream are unalterable, right? Uh, which is an important thing because lo lots of times the future will be predicted in the Bible but then won't unfold according to the divine prediction. A great example of that is in the book of Jonah when Jonah shows up in Nineveh and says in 40 days this city will be overturned. Come on in. Um, we've just gone around the room and room and shared the most embar embarrassing experience in their, uh, in their life. <laughs> You're the last. <laughs> okay, back to the point. So, um, in the Jonah story, when he walks through the streets of Nineveh, he remarks that um, in 40 days the city will be overturned. That's uh, the content of the prophecy that God has delivered to Jonah. So that would seem, at least initially, to be a sure thing, but uh, I'm sure, as most of you know, uh, as the story proceeds, the Ninevites repent, and so the divine decree, the divine prophecy, is rescinded. So presumably that's also the case, or possible, uh, with respect to dream interpretations. Uh, but the fact that Pharaoh has had this identical dream twice, uh, Joseph uh, hastens to add once he provides the most important element of interpretation of the dreams, that is the prediction of the famine, the years of plenty and the years of famine that will come, the fact that it's occurred twice means there's nothing uh, humanly that can be done to alter uh, the sequence of events that's about to uh, befall us. That's very important then for our story, I think, because what does that say about the earlier dream sequences if uh, we know that's the case? Subject to change? Except for well, Joseph. Joseph's, why, why would Joseph's not? Because he has the two, I don't know, I remember the one with the sheaves and corn, but, you know, where he's like, oh, and then the stars. Where right, so there's two the dreams there, too. So we know that that's a dream that's also, you know, unalterable, right? So we learn that. That frequently happens in the Bible, is that uh, we learn a very important fact, you know, quite a ways into the story that sheds light on something we've already read. We wouldn't have known... Uh, that frequently happens in, you know, all good art forms, right? One of my favorite movies I watched over the last year was The Tree of Life by Malick. But um, it was actually a very frustrating film to watch the first time because you don't know what, what it's about until the very end. And then it's too late. You have to go watch it again to figure out what, what on earth was going on at the beginning, right? That's what I had to do. I only really liked it the second time through. The first time I had no idea what was going on. Uh, that frequently happens in the Bible as well. That, uh, the Bible rewards uh, the person who reads it uh, uh, over and over again because frequently uh, what you need to know at the beginning you don't uh, always know. Well, let's begin uh, with just the very beginning of the story. Uh, I'm going to begin in uh, Genesis uh, uh, 37. I know we won't all have the same translation. That's always a, a problem uh, with uh, Bible studies. The one uh, I, I suppose I despise all translations equally. Uh, there's <laughs> nothing better than the, um, in my estimation, the Hebrew original, but that uh, is not going to do here. Um, I'm personally going to be reading from uh, the Jewish Publication Society translation, the JPS uh, version, 
uh, in part because I, I like this. It's the Oxford Study Bible. The annotations, I think, for uh, the book of Genesis are extraordinary. They're written by one of my uh, dearest friends and colleagues, uh, John Levinson. I highly commend them to you. Uh, but um, it won't be important whatever translation you wish to read. Uh, I don't think that, w what, certainly what we're going to do today, uh, there won't be any significant uh, translation difficulties. But if you have significant differences, or you feel there's significant differences in what you have from what I read, uh, please feel free to uh, stop me uh, at any point and really ask questions at any point you know, along the way. So let's begin with chapter 37. Is everyone uh, there? Chapter 37, verse 1. Uh, it begins uh, with the sentence, Now Jacob was settled in the land where his father had sojourned, uh, the land of Canaan. Uh, this then is the line of Jacob. So that's all by way of introduction, and then our story begins. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended the flocks with his brothers uh, as a helper to the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah, and Zilpah. We've already actually learned something exceedingly uh, important here. A number of things. 17, so Joseph's young. Uh, he's tending flocks. Anybody has a very significant detail? Anyone have uh, an indication why that might be an important detail in our story? David was a shepherd. David was a shepherd, right. Anybody else think of in the Bible? Old or New Testament is described as a shepherd. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is the good shepherd, right? Psalm 23. What is everyone? If anyone knows a psalm, they always know that. How does it begin? Who is my shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. Yes, this goes back to a, a very ancient motif from the ancient Near East that the Bible is heir to, which imagines uh, kings uh, as shepherds vis-a-vis uh, -vis their flock. Care, they care for their flock. Uh, the way a uh, shepherd cares uh, for his flock, and it's not by accident that the very first detail we learn, or one of the first details we learn about Moses as a grown man, is that he's tending the flock of his uh, uh, father-in-law right before the burning bush. Moses, of course, will emerge as a great leader in Israel, so it's not, not by accident that he's tending a flock at the beginning of a story. And King David... Uh, when Samuel goes to Bethlehem to name the king in the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel, um, he reviews all the sons of Eli. David's not there. Why is David not there? He's out, they say, tending the flock, right? So uh, these are not accidental details. The future leaders of Israel, when we first meet them, are frequently uh, tending uh, their flock. So it says, Joseph tended the flocks with his brothers, and then this last sentence is also very important. In the book of Genesis, it's about the family, uh, the family that will eventually become the people Israel. Uh, but the people Israel um, is, uh, the, the, the title Israel is simply the alternative name of Jacob. Right? His name is Jacob Israel. He's born uh, Yaakov in Hebrew, Jacob. Uh, uh, and that's his birth name. But after wrestling with the angel, he's given a new name, uh, Israel. Jacob, Israel, and uh, it's not by accident then that he has 12 sons, each of which is going to be, uh, their name is going, they're going to give as a legacy to a tribe. So it would be like a story if we were to imagine writing a story about the founding of the United States and we had characters with the names North Carolina, Georgia, New York, Connecticut. Um, you would know when you met those characters that um, the story writer, of course, would give them uh, idiosyncrasies of human persons, but you would know that there is a second level of meaning that they represent uh, a geographical uh, territory and people associated with that territory, and that's certainly the case here uh, with um, all, the, all the sons uh, of Jacob were meant to uh, think of a map of the land of Israel first and foremost, um, but we're also meant to think of the family line of Jacob. How many wives did Jacob have? He had at least four, according to this. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, technically he had two wives. Leah. Yeah, he had two. two. But he had, it said he had, you know, he had Leah and Rachel, but then Bilhah Bil and, and the they were the maidservants of oh, the wives, okay. right. So just as, going back to the story of Abraham, uh, his wife, um, 
uh, Sarah was barren, so uh, in order to provide children, Sarah offered to Abraham her maidservant. I don't remember her name. Hagar. Hagar, right. Uh, from uh, which would come the son Ishmael. And uh, that happens also with uh, uh, Leah and Rachel. Uh, Leah doesn't have any, time, any trouble uh, producing children, but Rachel, we learn, is barren. Uh, the uh, preferred wives in Genesis are all strikingly barren. Sarah, uh, Rebecca, uh, and Rachel, they all share that. Uh, many of the significant uh, women uh, in the Old Testament are barren. Uh, Hannah, uh, Ruth, um, not by accident, the biblical writer wants to make the point that um, uh, when these mothers uh, become pregnant, it's by virtue of divine intervention. Um, I have a colleague uh, t uh, in Jewish studies, Michael Wishigrod, he's now retired, but he once told the story, he was in synagogue once talking about uh, his um, interest in Christian theology, and uh, a question was raised about the peculiar Christian doctrine of the virgin birth, that there really was no analogy in Judaism, and uh, he quickly answered, he said, well, what about um, Sarah's uh, pregnancy uh, with Isaac? Uh, it's quite extraordinary. That's uh, actually beyond uh, the miracle of uh, Rebecca uh, or Rachel, because why is that? Why, why is it so extraordinary that Sarah becomes pregnant? She's 90. And her husband was also. <laughs> yeah, but it's more important, the biologically, it's more important than her age. Why? She was 90. Beyond. And she's postmenopausal, right? And so the ancients knew as well as moderns, maybe even better than moderns, because we learn it in the textbook, they knew it from real life, that when you're postmenopausal, the chances of having a child uh, slip to zero, right? So the fact that she becomes pregnant is, you know, in many respects, every bit as miraculous uh, as the virgin birth uh, in the Gospel of Luke. And Gospel of Luke clearly. Uh, thinking of these analogies as he composes his story, Luke, because he begins uh, with the birth of John the Baptist. And what about John the Baptist's parents? Yeah. They're barren, yeah. right? So it's recalling this theme from Genesis. Uh, uh, so Jesus is like uh, one of the beloved sons in Genesis. So his back, the background of his birth, his miraculous birth, is similar to the miraculous birth of the children of Israel. Um, my colleague, John Levinson, who uh, did the, uh, the notes for this Bible, has a nice uh, section on this in another one of his books in which he writes about the question. Israel, of course, will be identified in the book of Exodus as um, uh, God's uh, firstborn son in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, I believe it is, uh, when Moses is being instructed to go speak to Pharaoh. He says, thus to the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. So he asks, well, how are we supposed to understand that? Merely as a metaphor that his firstborn son refers to the fact that Israel is beloved to God? Uh, or is it more than metaphorical? And he really wants to argue strongly it's more than metaphorical. The reason uh, why we have these stories uh, of barren women concentrated in the book of Genesis uh, is that uh, God does take an active role uh, in the production of the people uh, he loves so dearly, uh, just as he takes an active role uh, in the production uh, of uh, Jesus uh, from the Virgin Mary. Uh, so the people of Israel are, uh, in some senses, uh, the, uh, have, have a legitimate claim to uh, the title uh, Sons of God. Their uh, engenderment is not according to the natural order uh, of the world. Uh, but now we've gone far afield from what we're looking at, but let's go back to it, uh, not completely uh, irrelevant, but we're talking about the uh, wives here of Jacob, so there's four, uh, well there's two wives and then two maidservants, Bilhah and Zilpah, and the reason why they're the maidservants, is this, is, this was the uh, reason why I went on that detour, is that Rachel, who's going to be the mother of Joseph, who's the beloved son, she'll be the mother of both Joseph and Benjamin, preferred sons of Jacob, uh, because Rachel is the preferred wife of the two wives. Um, but Joseph, in terms of natural birth order, comes at the very end. He's the 11th uh, son uh, born to Jacob, but this is also shouldn't surprise the reader of the book of Genesis, because um, in every instance, the beloved son is almost, well, I shouldn't say in every instance, but almost every instance, the beloved son is always the latter-born son 
Uh, it's always a surprise. And the beloved wife, of course, in the story is the latter-born woman. Leah is the firstborn, Rachel is the secondborn. Uh, a very uh, deep theme uh, with respect to the Bible, I think also making the point that these choices of uh, beloved son, chosen son, or chosen daughter are divine choices, not merely human choices. And as a result, the book of Genesis uh, at every turn uh, casts you know, uh, this notion of surprise before us. Uh, participants in the story are shocked at the uh, choices uh, that God makes. Uh, so Joseph is the beloved son, but we can see here he's not necessarily the beloved son to his brothers. How could we infer that from, uh, in, uh, now you probably all know what's going to come, but just from what we see here in verse 2, how would we know he's presumably not the beloved son of his brothers? Think of the family totem pole here, and uh, how the brothers would presumably rank themselves uh, uh, if they could. The idea is... Mine he's described as the assistant of the brothers. Right, he's the assistant, but... Uh, uh, so he's. Uh, what does your line say? He's an assistant. He was he was an assistant to the sons of his father's wives? That's all it says. Bilhan. Bilhan ah, yeah. You have to add that. That's important. So that's very important. So what? What if it, if it just said he's the assistant to the sons of his father's wives? Okay, but it says he's the assistant to the sons of his father's wives, Bilhan Zilpa. Why is that important? Well, they're not even. They're, they're sons of handmaids, not of married wives. Right, so he's clearly at the bottom of the pecking order, right? He's at the bottom. These are the least significant of the four women. Uh, and Joseph is the youngest brother, so presumably his older brothers have said, you know, you, you're not worthy to be with us, uh, the sons of uh, primarily Leah uh, and Rachel, but we'll have you hang out with uh, the sons of uh, the maidservants, because that's where you belong. So the story is playing with Joseph is obviously going to be, is already set a kind of irony or attention here. He's tending the flock, which means as a reader we're expecting this guy's going to be a leader, right? He's tending the flock, he's, he's a future king, but he's hanging out with the sons of Zilpah and Bilhah. Now that's not right. Uh, that's, that doesn't, that's not the honor that would uh, presumably come to his uh, royal office, but uh, we'll see the reasons for that shortly. The very next line says, Joseph brought bad reports uh, of them to their father. Uh, in other words, he's a, he's a tattletale, right? uh, which in the Bible, uh, as in the modern world, is not a laudatory office. Right? Um, it's good, of course, to be honest. Uh, but honesty has a certain decorum uh, with respect to uh, a family. And for our biblical writer, uh, this is a strong uh, message of uh, condemnation with respect to uh, Joseph. Uh, then verse 3, also important, Israel, that is Jacob. Jacob Israel loved Joseph best of all his sons, for he was the son of his old age. Uh, he was the last, the eleventh, uh, also born to Rachel. And in order to make this, you know, visible to everybody, he made him an ornamented tunic. Very important detail. I mean, everybody knows we're all in situations at every turn of our day where we know that there are differential preferences, right? No one, everyone claims to love everybody equally, but in fact, none of us could ever do that because we're embodied human beings. We favor certain office workers. We favor certain friends. All, life is characterized by differential affections, right? Uh, and part of what it means to mature as an individual is to make your way in a world in which uh, these differential affections are uh, from time to time quite visible. Uh, most of us, I think, uh, hopefully most of us, as we mature, manage to deal with this uh, in, a, in a mature fashion, in part because differential differences, uh, though we can infer them, they have to be inferred. They're not visible, you know, at every turn, uh, right? The, they're, they're ignorable uh, for the most part. It's only in, you know, particularly pointed uh, circumstances that the element of uh, preference becomes so obvious we can't avoid it. Those become painful moments, but if they're infrequent enough, we manage to, you know, make our way, kind of swallow our pride and move on. Uh, the horror here, and Jacob is by no means the ideal father, is he seems to be oblivious uh, to this, and so he's going to make it obvious 24-7. 
right? Who is uh, the favorite son within the family? And that's certainly the function of this tunic. He wants to make it crystal clear, uh, you know, from the very beginning uh, that Joseph uh, is the apple of his eye, and we can already see that Joseph is an individual who's going to exploit uh, that favor uh, to his benefit, uh, because he's a tattletale. So it's offensive at least at those two levels, uh, that the father has made it uh, visible 24-7, uh, this preference, and that Joseph abuses uh, the preference shown him uh, by taking advantage of it uh, to uh, uh, the detriment of his brothers. So we can already see there are good signs that um, there will be considerable anger in this family. Now, Jacob is, you know, culpable here. There, I think there's no question about that. Um, but uh, what if you know the Bible well, you know the, especially the previous story, the story of Jacob's life, what might explain uh, his, you know, in scare quotes here, stupidity? Why, why would he do this? Previous generations kind of did the same thing, so it's standard operation in that genealogy, right? Well, he they, his father, no, he served his brother. Yes. Tricked, he duped, he stole the birthright. Right, but that, that you, you're 50% of the way there. So what, is, what was the problem? The, in, so in every family in the book of Genesis, of course, there are things that are, you know, laudable, but there are also, um, trying to think of what the psychological speech is, there's dysfunctional elements, that's the word we want. There's elements of dysfunction as well, right? So here the dysfunction is going to be predicated on Jacob's inability to, um, uh, to manage uh, properly his differential affections. But what's the problem that Jacob faced as a young man? He was duped by his father-in-law, and so he was forced to marry Leah before he could marry his preferred wife, Rachel. That's true, that's so, true, that's that's good, but we want to actually go that, back to his, his, that. Yeah, his relationship. He's a mama's boy. I'm, he's a mama's boy. <laughs> so that's can true. you say more? Why is he a mama's boy? Uh, she favored him. Dad favored, they were twins. Uh. And why did she fa why did she fa why did Rebecca favor him? He was but why soft and, and uh, more of a homebody and his brother Esau was the hunter and the, right. the burly man. Uh -huh. And he was the girly man. I don't know right. sure. No, <laughs> no, that's right. He, Isaac uh, that's favored true. Esau. Isaac favored Esau, that's right. But why, why does Rebecca fa uh, uh, are the considerations merely natural? Uh, it's part they are partly that. But um, why is it what what her interpretation of the oracle She's right, God provides an oracle that uh, declares that uh, the latter-born son will be the preferred son. So she's in the know in terms of divine preferences. Isaac is in the dark. So the whole the whole tension in the family. The reason why Jacob has to he has to you know run for fear of his life and lives you know a miserable existence for for decades. In fact, he'll leave his mother and never see her again. She'll die before his return. It's quite tragic. But the whole challenge of his life is the fact that the father was in the dark, right, about divine providence. And that's why he has to dupe him. And because he has to dupe him, then he, you know, enrages uh, Esau. Uh, and Esau is justly enraged. Uh, and Jacob is going to be justly punished for what he does. But it's, uh, uh, it is in the order of uh, divine providence that Jacob be preferred. So... Presumably here, Jacob says, well, I'm going to spare, you know, my son the consequences of what I had to go through. Uh, my father never knew. That was the source of all my unhappiness. I know I'm going to make it clear right from the get-go. Uh, but um, I can remember, actually, a colleague of mine at a previous school I taught uh, uh, when she had her first child rel relatively late in her life, she told me that she was not going to make any of the mistakes her mother made raising this child. I remember thinking, oh, you'll make all your own mistakes. <laughs> you'll, 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 be, you'll creatively make mistakes your mother could never have imagined making, right? Uh, so um, uh, I, I, what we have here, I think, is a, a, a nice example of that. I think if we're going to understand the logic here of Jacob, uh, his actions based on his own personal experience from the past are eminently reasonable. Uh, but as often happens in human life, uh, the solution is often a source of problems uh, one uh, couldn't have imagined from the beginning. 
So continuing here, it begins, verse 4, it says, When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of his brothers, they hated him so that they could not speak a friendly word to him. Um, and the, the culpability of Jacob here is going to grow because not only is he foolish in terms of how he's going to display his affections publicly towards the family and not rebuke Joseph for being a tattletale, but he's not going to be observant in any way of the festering anger that's happening right under his nose. And uh, later in this chapter, he's going to quite unadvisedly send Joseph off uh, to check on his brothers uh, away from his oversight. And um, uh, it should be no surprise to the reader. Uh, not necessarily, they wouldn't guess that Joseph is going to, you know, be uh, treated the way, he w the way he will. That It is rather extreme, but we certainly could guess from what we've read so far that if the brothers ever get, you know, Joseph uh, on his own, apart from his dad, that it's going to be payback time, uh, as they say. And uh, Jacob here is completely uh, in the dark about that. Um, Obviously, and uh, that, that, that fits, you know, Jacob's uh, character earlier uh, in the story as well. But this leads to the first set of dreams, which is very important, uh, and we're going to read them through once and then come back to them. What's important to note about this first set of dreams is we already said there's six dreams in uh, the Joseph story. Um, what's distinctive about the last four is that they're subject to uh, divine interpretation. It's very important that um, Joseph is called to interpret the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker and to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh, the two dreams of Pharaoh. Pharaoh especially makes the point that you know, he calls Joseph to his court because he's heard he's a fantastic you know, interpreter of dreams. What does Joseph say? Does anyone remember when uh, Joseph, uh, when Pharaoh says that to him, I hear that you, uh, you know, uh, your he CV says, says... He says he doesn't interpret them, God does. Yeah, very important. Joseph deflects all uh, praise from himself back towards God. It's not his ability uh, that's at issue here with respect to the interpretation of the dreams. It's rather... Uh, the interpretation that God has provided. That's an important motif to bear in mind because there is no, these two dreams have no interpretation here. Every, the, they are interpreted. We're going to see it's quite clear how uh, they don't say what the interpretation is, but we can infer that quite clearly. But what's important to emphasize is that in these first two dreams, unlike the next four, uh, no character steps forward and says, you know, uh, God and, you know, means this not that. That's very important, uh, extremely important. These interpretations, in other words, are not subject to any divine filter. Rather, they're like a Rorschach test uh, that brings to the surface uh, the feelings of the brothers uh, within the family. Uh, very important. So, verse 5 begins, Once Joseph had a dream, and he told his brothers, and they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream which I have dreamed, there we were binding sheaves in the field when suddenly my sheep stood up and remained upright. Then your sheaves gathered around and bowed low to my sheaf. Uh, and here the brothers make what seems to be the obvious inference, right? And presumably this is what Joseph, if we could interview him, though he's not going to speak, would have thought as well uh, about this dream. He says, do you mean to reign over us? Do you mean to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his talk about his dreams. Uh, maybe let me say just one thing briefly about this. I've uh, had people, when I've done this Bible, bef Bible study before, try to venture the claim that um, Joseph here is, uh, is an innocent. He's going to suffer innocently in chapter 37. I think that's a, a very difficult claim uh, to, um, to support. Uh, tattletales are uh, uh, subject to extreme uh, condemnation in the book of Proverbs uh, and exploitation of one's office to the detriment of others is, you know, thoroughly, uh, the, that idea is the one is thoroughly disabused. That's a good idea throughout the Bible. Uh, but it's useful here with respect to these dreams. One might want to make the case, well, you know, in fact, the dream does come true. We'll see that the brothers are going to bow and scrape before Joseph probably a half a dozen times 
uh, in the story, even at the very end, chapter 50, which we're going to look at in a moment, the very end of the story, they're bowing low, saying, we're your slaves, so on and so forth. So these, there is an element of these dreams that definitely comes true, you know, in uh, conformity with what I said about Pharaoh's dream, right? Uh, but how they come true, of course, is going to be uh, the point that we're going to want to tend to. But one could make the claim, well, the dreams came true, you know, they're true. Uh, Joseph simply has to be, you know, the message of truth, and the brothers have to, uh, you know, uh, come to grips with um, what, you know, providence here has ordained. But it's very useful, I think, to uh, take a look at another um, vision sequence in the Bible to uh, not run too fast down that path in terms of reading this story. If you look at the beginning of the book of Samuel, uh, Hannah, of course, the barren woman, uh, becomes pregnant and will deliver Samuel. Samuel in chapter 3 will find himself uh, in the temple with the high priest Eli because his mother vows him uh, to the temple as a result of her gratefulness for having become pregnant. Uh, and does anyone remember that story, what happens when uh, Samuel is in the temple with Eli? Is this when he keeps hearing someone call his name? Mm -hmm. What do you remember? Here I am, Lord. Samuel. Samuel keeps hearing, and so what does he do? Samuel, when he, and then here I am, Lord, he goes to Eli. Right, and what does Eli say? He says, go back to sleep, I haven't called you. Right, you know, Sam, time, so, so, so he, Samuel hears this voice and thinks it's Eli, right? right. So. And on the third time, uh, Eli says, if you hear it again, say, here I am, Lord. Speak your son, <coughs> thing. Very good. And then the Lord speaks. Now, they got the main, main frame. Do you remember what God then says to Samuel? No, I don't. <laughs> That's the important part. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by that time of the story, you were bored. Uh, no, well, that's very important. What he does is uh, God tells Samuel that Eli, Eli's house is coming to a terrible end. His sons are going to be put to death. You know, uh, the ark is going to be taken captivity. I mean, it's as grim as grim can be. And so Eli in the morning comes up to Samuel and says, well, what was the dream, right? And Samuel is a sensitive guy. He doesn't want to tell him. Even though the dream is about his replacing the house of Eli, you know, he's a man, you know, of moral scruple. This is, this is not good news. He likes Eli, doesn't want to tell him. Completely unlike Joseph, right? Uh, <laughs> Eli forces it out of him by making him take an oath. Um, and Eli uh, is able to uh, digest the news uh, with... Um, very soberly, because he realizes the accusations that are being made about his, uh, about the abuse of the priesthood by his sons uh, are accurate. But it's an important study in character contrast, right? That Samuel would have a dream that's clearly true, uh, but he's horrified about its contents vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the people, uh, the person, as it were, it's about. And so, you know, the only way that this dream can be squeezed out of him is uh, by forcing him to swear Whereas Joseph, of course, is quite happy uh, on the first occasion to tell his brothers uh, about his dream, uh, obviously to, uh, to heighten uh, their uh, rage about him. So uh, Joseph understands the important theological element here, very important element, is that Joseph understands this dream uh, and the brothers as a dream about power. Right? Power is understood as a kind of zero-sum entity. You know, if I've got 80%, then you've only got 20%, right? The kind of Hegel's, you know, Hegel's famous master-slave dialectic that, you know, every relationship is, a, is divisible on some, you know, kind of power quadrant. Uh, what I have, you don't have. And what you have, I don't have. And all of human life is a struggle uh, to uh, uh, achieve uh, dominance uh, over others. And uh, this story illustrates that. Know, uh, quite nicely. And uh, the next dream is very similar. We won't read it, but about the sun, moon, and stars. Uh, here, even the father is outraged because it seems as though he also uh, is going to be an, an individual subservient to Joseph. Um, but the father makes none of the right deductions here about uh, what this tells us about Joseph's character. Now, what the whole Joseph story is about uh, at one level is Joseph's transformation. And for that, we have to turn to chapter 50. Uh, the very end of the story. So as frequently, you know, any good story, like any good movie, uh, always begins with trying to understand the beginning and the end, right? Uh, one of my favorite examples of that, well, I mentioned Tree of Life is fantastic with that respect because it uh, uh, opens in a way you only understand 
uh, once you've seen the whole film, but Saving Private Ryan is that way as well. A lot of films, a lot of books begin that way where you're, you're watching this man uh, in uh, a cemetery uh, in, uh, near where uh, the Allied troops landed in Normandy, but you don't know what's going on. It's, well, it's the end of the movie, right? You have to watch the whole movie in order to know what that you know, opening scene was. Uh, so frequently in good literature, uh, good movies, it's good to know the beginning and the end, and then you can triangle, uh, uh, tri by triangulation, find your way to everything else in between. So Genesis 50 ends with the brothers returning to the land of Canaan <coughs> briefly to bury their father after he dies. Uh, and the brothers here who have uh, attempted to murder Joseph uh, are quite fearful that now that the father has died, uh, there will be no protection from them with respect to Joseph's perhaps uh, gathering feelings of vengeance and anger towards them. So they worry that once the father has been entoured, uh, they will be the subject of Joseph's revenge. So in verse 18, is everyone with me? Chapter 50, verse 18. Here we have the last of what I call these prostration scenes. It says, His brothers went to him themselves and flung themselves before him and said, We're prepared to be your slaves, right? And complete fulfillment. We might want to argue of the dream sequence in chapter 37. We might think that Joseph would simply turn to his brothers or maybe to us as readers and say, see, it all you know, happened just according to divine providence. You know, if you had just you know, gotten this straight back in chapter 37, uh, we would have all lived you know, a much uh, easier life. Uh, but in fact, that's not what's said. Um, Joseph responds to this, what... John Milton would call knee tribute. I love that term, knee tribute. Of course, one normally pays tribute in the form of cash or material goods, but you can also pay tribute in the form of uh, genuflection towards a superior. Joseph says uh, he's not interested in that. Have no fear. Am I a substitute for God? In other words, uh, is he saying that the first dream has no value? Uh, he doesn't want the prostration, uh, as presumably was predicted back in Genesis 37. Besides, he says, and this is an extraordinary line, one of the most extraordinary lines in the entire Bible, although you intended me harm, God intended it for good so as to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Um, there's a great essay, in fact, you can find it uh, on YouTube, uh, a uh, uh, lecture by one of my favorite biblical scholars, Uriel Simon of Bar Ilan University in, in, in Israel, um, gives it in a, uh, a uh, house of study in Jerusalem, our days, a very important, prominent place, uh, in which he makes the point that the Joseph story is an excellent example of what the relationship is between divine providence and human free will. Because the Joseph story is extraordinary in the sense that uh, God's hand is almost never visible in any explicit way in any of the chapters from 37 to 50. Uh, you can read the chapters as simply a concatenation of finite, contingent human choices that the characters make. There's no, unlike uh, Abraham and Jacob where God appears in dreams and tells the characters to do this or that, uh, everyone in the Joseph story acts by virtue of their own recognizance. It's, you know, free will writ large, yet the whole story, in terms of its salvific import at the end, turns on Joseph's recognition that though everyone acted freely, in fact, at the same time, all those free decisions were incorporated into part of a larger divine plan. So that there is no... Um, contradiction between claiming that human beings are absolutely free and are responsible for every choice they make and the notion that God is in control of the destiny of the world he's fashioned and loves so deeply. How that works out metaphysically, you know, well you can look at Thomas Aquinas and many people have uh, tried to account for this in very learned ways, 
Uh, but for the, the Bible, uh, simply the statement uh, that the Joseph story wants to make is that the two are by no means, uh, uh, by any means contradictory. God can use finite human decisions, even decisions uh, that are intended for evil, to achieve uh, by the miracle of his divine providence the good uh, that he desires. Um, and so he says, you intended me harm, God intended it for good so as to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Now there's many more things to say about verse 20, but we're getting near the end of our hour. Maybe if we have time at the very end, I may say something, but uh, I can't say everything that, you know, uh, speak to all of the levels of resonance within this verse, which are extraordinary. The thing we want to see here is that Joseph's not interested in the knee tribute of his brothers uh, and his recognition here that the only reason he has authority over his brothers uh, is to feed them. Right? He was elected by God uh, as the beloved son to make his way into Egypt, to rise to prominence within Pharaoh's house for one purpose and one purpose alone, that was to interpret Pharaoh's dreams so that you know, his family would survive. Right? If, he's, if he's not there, everybody's dead, right? If he's not there interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, not only is his whole family dead, all of Egypt's dead. So uh, his role is extraordinary uh, in terms of uh, what God intends for him. Uh, and he realizes here at the end of the story something he doesn't know in chapter 37 by any means uh, is that God's choosing him uh, and his father of course is the mediator of that choice is that the choice isn't about him uh, and his power rather the choice is about God's people uh, and serving God's people right everyone follow me on that so with that in mind uh, it's very interesting then to turn back to these first couple of dreams. Uh, let's go back to them in chapter 37. And let's look at it again. So Joseph says to them, hear this dream which I have dreamed. Is everyone with me? Verse 6. There we were binding sheaves in the field when suddenly my sheaf stood up and remained upright your sheaves gathered around and bowed low to my sheaf. So let's think about this. If we take a look at the dreams, it's quite amazing how many of them have to do with food. Right? <laughs> Five out of six have to do with food. Only the second one doesn't. It's a Jewish occasion. It's a Jewish occasion. There we go. Uh, that's, a good, uh, that's a good line. I remember a, a colleague of mine um, I met in graduate school, his wife is Israeli, he's since become Israeli, he commented on the difference between uh, holiday parties in the, in the United States and in the land of Israel. He said when you go to a holiday party, his wife was a, an executive, uh, Christmas party, uh, what happens is that there will be a table full of food and there will be the open bar, food is ignored, everybody is at the open bar. That's the United States and Israel, there's an open bar, there's food, no one's at the open bar, but the food is being uh, consumed, even the table top, the table legs, <laughs> everything's gone. Uh, I've heard that that's changed a little bit since the uh, wide-scale uh, uh, immigration of Russian Jews. Uh, they brought the love of vodka into the land of Israel, but um, it, is, uh, uh, it, it, it is true, I think. Uh, uh, statistically, the lowest level of alcoholism of any people in the world is uh, uh, are, are, are Jews, which is interesting because, of course, on several occasions within the Jewish liturgical year, you're uh, commanded to become tipsy. Not, it's not just an option. Uh, it's, uh, it's a command. I'm sorry? There's one this week. Is it uh, Purim? Yeah, Purim and then uh, the four cups at uh, Passover. Right. Uh, the secret is to have a small cup. Uh, all right. So, um, but where were we? So we take a look at the, yes, about the food. So if we take a look at the, the cup bearer uh, has the dream about food, and then Pharaoh too dreams about food. This is a dream about food as well. So here, uh, there's just a brief annotation here I'm going to read uh, uh, with respect to this dream that I think gets at uh, exactly what it, what it must have meant in terms of its divine intention, but the meaning uh, that all of our characters in chapter 37 uh, have no, not even a glimmer of. So my annotation reads, in each of these three pairs of dreams in the Joseph story, 
One dream focuses on grain or grain products. The brothers, and Joseph we might want to say as well, see only dominance in this first dream, missing altogether the symbolism of the grain imagery. When they do bow down to him, think of the first time they're going to come, they're going to be coming to Egypt, right, to get grain from Joseph. It will be in supplication that he, who has grain when they do not, uh, will feed them. Right? So uh, it's easy to go back here to this dream again in chapter 37, once we've read the whole story and see that perhaps the deeper significance of the story completely uh, outside the ambit of the ability of any of our characters in chapter 37 to understand it properly, is that this isn't a dream about dominance and submission, though it allows that possibility. It's like a Rorschach that just, just brings that right out uh, up to the surface. Uh, but presumably it's deeper meaning that we can see Joseph knows when we get to chapter 50 is it's about Joseph having sheaves of grain that he can offer to his brothers who do not. Uh, one colleague of mine suggested maybe to even put a finer point on this. If we think of the way in which the brothers' arrival in the land of Egypt is described, they come with sacks, right? So uh, they come with sacks before Joseph. Uh, the sacks, of course, they come with are empty, and an empty sack, of course, will just lie crumpled on the ground. But a full sack will stand upright, right, by virtue of the grain. And perhaps that's, you know, the most fundamental meaning of the first dream, is that their sacks are crumpled on the ground, Joseph's sack is full. Joseph's obligation, the point of the dream then isn't, you know, your serfs, I'm the king, I'm the man. Uh, the point is, Joseph has grain, fill their sacks. Right? Uh, and that's the meaning, uh, what, which I want to suggest, uh, that both for Joseph uh, and for the brothers, they're too young, they simply can't understand it. And that's the significance, I think, within the way the story is being told here. It's really the literary brilliance of our author of Genesis, of not, these dreams, are, there's, no, there's no divine interpretation, right? Because the, the characters in the story are too young. Uh, the story is too young. Uh, it will take uh, the some 14 chapters of the book of Genesis uh, and all the hardships these characters are going to go through for God to kind of drill into their heads uh, what the meaning uh, of these dreams uh, at the beginning of the story uh, were. Well, I think we got just a few minutes. I think I'll stop here rather than go back to 50. We'll start maybe with 50 uh, next time, uh, just briefly. I'll go back to the, that, that, that section. There's a little bit more to say, but um, happy to entertain any questions people might have. Or observations or whatever. Any comments? I thought it was kind of interesting. You were talking about, like, you know, he's the sheep that's going to provide the grain or whatever, and then later uh, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, you know, and in a way that leadership is about the giving and the serving rather than the, than the right. knee high nature. Knee tribute, exactly. Knee tribute, no, that's yes. a huge theme, of course, in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. A very similar theme to what we see in Joseph. So the Gospels are um, anticipated already, we might want to say, in the, in the Joseph story. I'm just thinking about practical implications for our lives. And just like if you look at any developing country, how you could look at this story and how they use food as just a source of power over other people. And people are left with empty sacks on the ground. And how we have such an obligation as Christians to fill other people's sacks. And, um, you know, I think that we do that maybe better at some points during the year than other points. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about volunteering that I've done at the food bank of northern Indiana and how Sometimes, you know, they say that they're just inundated with volunteers and donations around the holidays. But July is some of their scarcest months. People just don't think about giving during those times of the year. Right. Uh, and 
you know, how this story kind of just has some other practical implications for our lives. It's kind of interesting. No, I think while jo Joseph's um, his religious status as you know a beloved son is completely predicated on you know um, is being elevated to such a position to provide for others. That's the, the sole purpose. And in this story, what's remarkable is it's not just about feeding his own family, though that is true. But you know he feeds by uh, design. It actually says in uh, in Genesis that the whole world uh, comes to Joseph. So. It's very interesting. There's a, there's a, a term, uh, a name, an alternative name that Joseph will be given by Pharaoh, Tzafnat Paneach, uh, which uh, we now know as a result of decoding ancient Egyptian what it means, but uh, both the rabbis and the church fathers had no idea uh, what the Egyptian origin of that word was, so they interpreted it uh, contextually. The rabbis understood it. Uh, in fact, we get two words in modern Hebrew from it. Uh, Tzofen in modern Hebrew is a word for a password or a code. Uh, and uh, lufaneach is the verb to solve. So safnat paneach is uh, Joseph was a code solver, right? Very obvious why you would do that. He's a dream interpreter, right? Um, Saint Jerome went in a different direction. He translated that term uh, salvator mundi uh, because he was attentive contextually to the role of Joseph feeding uh, the entire world. Salvator mundi in Latin means savior of the world. Um, so clearly Jerome saw Joseph as, you know, a miniature uh, Christ figure in the sense that he understood his uh, status as uh, beloved by God as uh, an um, obligation to, uh, to uh, serve others and, uh, you know, that salvific role. So what was the Egyptian? <laughs> uh, you know, that's a good question. I'm not, I don't know ancient Egyptian, but there is a footnote here. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. You better study that soon. <laughs> Yeah, let's see here. There is a footnote in my Bible that will reveal that. Uh, the Egyptian for God speaks, he lives, or creator of life. Either will work, too. Mm -hmm. Well, at 1 o'clock, should we probably close down? Yeah, we'll re adjourn here in uh, two weeks' time. Same time, same place. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.